Hi, I'm David Aitman, founder of The Bucket, and your host today for The Bucket Podcast. Today is a special treat for me, as I hope it will be for you, as I am talking to one of my literary heroes, David McCullough. David is an author, lecturer, and historian. He is a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, and a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States' highest civilian award. He is also an incredible narrator, whose voice you'll recognize from the film Seabiscuit, Ken Burns' documentary, The Civil War, uh, The American Experience. Uh, it's a privilege and a thrill to welcome David McCullough. Hello, David. Thank you, sir. It's a privilege for me to take part in this. I well, think it's a you. wonderful idea. Uh, as just talking about your narration, uh, with my wife and I over the years, we'll walk in on someone watching a show and it's your narrating. And we look at each other and go, sorry, it was David McCullough. We couldn't stop listening. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so well, I have um, a story that my kids love and grandchildren love and a number of my friends love. But I um, was in the supermarket in Boston, in Back Bay, where we were living at, at the time. And a fellow there with a Star Market shirt on was going by, and I couldn't find the cashew nuts. And I asked him, please, if he could show me where they were. And he led me to the, it was very crowded. It was in the midst of a blizzard and the people were trying to get provisions to survive. And, and of course, as you know, you have to have cashews to survive. <laughs> and uh, he led me to it and then went away and I thanked him. And about 10 minutes later, I was checking out the cash register and he came up to me and he said, excuse me, but I was listening to your voice. Are you, were you the narrator of the Ken Burns Civil War series? And I said, yes, I was. He said, well, <clears throat> I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because when that series first came on the air, I was suffering terribly from insomnia. <laughs> and I heard your voice and would go right out. <laughs> so you never know what form compliments are going to come in. Wow. It's quite a compliment. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I've read a lot of your books, uh, the actual book, but lately I listen to a lot on Audible while I'm driving. Yes. And uh, so hearing you read a lot of your books, it's, it's such a treat. And what you really feel like is that you're not an historian, you're a reporter. Like you're at the scene and you've done so much research. That well, thank you. It's like you're there. And so was that always how you intended to write history or is that something that you discovered? Well, I never really intended to write history. I was an English major in college and I went to work for time and life in New York after I got out of college. And when John Kennedy called on us to do something for our country, I took it entirely to heart and went down to Washington to see if I could find a job where my education and my about six years experience that by then might be applicable, wound up working for the U.S. Information Agency. And it was during those years that I happened upon a collection of photographs at the Library of Congress about the Johnstown flood cameraman, photographer from Pittsburgh, which is nearby and which was where I grew up, <clears throat> got over the mountains into the city and took these incredible photographs showing the total destruction of a city. And it was so decimating, so um, hard to believe that that had ever happened in our country that I thought, what caused it? What happened? And I began reading and doing a little poking around and I became utterly fascinated by it because it's about what can happen when you assume the people of in positions of responsibility are behaving responsibly and they weren't. And um, I thought uh, maybe I could write a book about this because the books that were then available were not satisfactory at all for me at least. Mm -hmm. And once I started doing it, I realized this is what I want to do. So I try to write as I've always admired in great writing, people who write for the ear as well as the eye. 
So uh, I've always asked my dear wife, Rosalie, to read what I've written aloud to me, because you hear things you don't see on paper. You hear yourself repeating the same word too often, or repeating the same sentence structure. And of course, most important of all, you hear when you're being boring. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to subject people to that. History is, should never be boring. It's about people. It's about life. It's about the uncertainties and the tragedies and the sufferings of life. But it's also, of course, about some marvelous accomplishments by human beings who set out to do something of high purpose and value and never imagining what adversities were going to be upon them. And nonetheless, because they didn't give up, succeeded. And in a way, that's what every one of my books has been about. Right. A lot, um, you know, you're an expert on the revolutionary experience. And reading 1776, which was basically post Bunker Hill, you know, the siege of Boston up to the Battle of Trenton, uh, a couple of things I noticed in that was the kind of glorification of war in some ways. There's, I have a couple of quotes where uh, Jabez Fitch from Connecticut. Uh, quote, enjoyed soldiering and felt that his son would too. And you talk about British soldiers saying, uh, quote, the great majority were young, drawn by the promise of adventure, perhaps a touch of glory. It seems like there was a romantic nature to war for some of these people. And that's very intriguing to me as part of the bucket in terms of how did people think of their own mortality back then? Did they think they'd live a long life? And did, if not, did that affect how decisions that they made? Well, it's a very perceptive question, and I thank you. First of all, I have believed, and I still do more so than ever, that there's far more to history than politics and war. And it's often the reverse, the way it's taught, that that's all it is, is politics and war. <clears throat> and of course, in many ways, that side of history, which isn't politics or isn't war, is often what has lasted longest in forms of art or architecture or sculpture, music, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And having written the book about John Adams, in which there's no direct contact with war, the, war, the reality of the war that was being fought, I felt to myself obligated to do a book about the realities of the war that was fought. And one thing that most Americans don't understand about the Revolutionary War is that it was thought to be an impossible achievement. A th only a third of the country was for it. And a third of the equal number, a third, was absolutely against it. They preferred to remain part of England. And the remaining third, in the good old human way, was waiting to see who won. And I wanted to write that book as pure narrative. It mo is designed to move forward. Uh, from the beginning page to the end. And um, I loved doing that. So they didn't have to take a side uh, step to talk about the philosophy or the philosophical attitude of certain characters and so forth. Um, and I also love to find good first-person reactions, descriptions, innermost feelings of little-known people. And that would be in letters and diaries. Now, we don't write letters and diaries anymore. Uh, but in many ways, you can get to know people doing research on them better than you know people in real life. Because for one thing, in real life, people don't let you read their letters or let you read their diaries. I felt that they, of course, did not expect to live as long as we do. But that was not in any way bothersome, because human beings had never lived as long as we do. Right. Uh, that's all new. And that perspective of length of life is all new. We see it in our children and grandchildren. They don't get married, for example, until they're 10 years older than we were when we got married. They, gr they grow up slower, in a way. And very often, it can be even more than 10 years later, it can be 20 years later. And they don't see that as any way out of the normal. And the extension of life 
is a new adventure. And being old, 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 is a new adventure in the human experience, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. And, um, and some of the best things I've done, in my view, I've written since I was 65. I think an awful lot of what matters in how old you feel or how down you might be inclined to feel because you're growing old has to do with how interested you are in what ha is happening to not just to the world, but to, in your own life. Talk about I've that. always wanted to be busy. I've always liked making things, particularly making things with my hands. As a little boy, I loved building model airplanes and I love painting. I still love painting. It's one of the greatest reliefs I know of. You get out there and paint, you forget everything else. It's, it's, it's all your, it's on your mind. Same way with writing. I like to work on a typewriter because it's worn with my hands and I can see the letters being printed on real paper. And after it's all done, I can keep that manuscript. It doesn't float away in the, into the thin air and it will be that way long after I'm not around. Uh, we just, Rosalie, just, my wife just found the original copy of the Johnstown Flood, which was written over 50 years ago. And there it is, just as it, the way it was when it came out of the typewriter. My feeling is, why not keep busy and why not make yourself useful? And that, in part, was due to the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. Make yourself useful. What did you do today, dear, that made things a little better, either for us or for other people or for the country or whatever. Well, going back to Revolutionary War days and the people, do you think that there was, in, there was more importance in legacy than longevity? That, you know, what am I living for? What Very I well put, for? absolutely. What are you gonna be remembered for? Do you wanna be remembered for sitting around in a comfortable couch watching television? Is that what you'd like to be remembered for? And not by the great population of the, of the world, but or your own children or your own grandchildren. What stories have you had to tell? Nobody lives the same life as anybody else. You will never meet anybody who doesn't know something that you don't know. And, no, and, and it isn't just because they have an equal advantage of a higher education or professional expertise or whatever. When I first wrote my, when I wrote my first book, I thought, well, I can't tell anyone about what I'm doing because they'll steal my idea. And one of my older writer friends said, don't worry about that. Nobody's going to steal your idea. Tell everybody you can possibly tell them about what you're working on because you never know who knows something that you don't know that you need to know or would like to know in order to write that book. And I still feel that way. I love curiosity. I've never embarked on a book I knew much about. If I knew all about it, I wouldn't want to write the book. To me, the book is an adventure. It's, a, it's going to a continent where I've never set foot. And that's the pull. Um, and I've never not found something along the way that nobody else had yet found. Or if they had, they hadn't realized how important it was. Just discovery, the excitement of discovery. And I try to encourage students, I lecture, or have for years lectured at colleges and universities all over the country. And I try to encourage them to have curiosity because curiosity accelerates and curiosity continues on irrespective of age or where you're living. and. It's energizing. Yeah, it, it, you know, we talk about um, you know people didn't live as long, but it, it's interesting that Adams lived till ninety. Oh, absolutely. And Jefferson lived it, into it, his eighties. And, and the characters that I've written about in my new book, Pioneers, they're living in the midst of every kind of disease, every kind of accident thing can happen, every kind of awful natural calamity 
floods, earthquakes, so forth, they all live on into their 80s. Because what the truth is, if they survive the various diseases of childhood, the chances of living a long life were very good. Do you think they lived their lives expecting that they wouldn't, though? Like they made, they made decisions on what to stand up for, not thinking that they would live that long, and they had to do something you know, while they were young, if you will. Yes. I think one of the mistakes that we make in looking back at our forebears in retrospect is you sort of forget that they had no more idea of how it was going to come out than we do. No foreseeable future. Never was. So for, you were talking about the pioneers, uh, you know, that mission to uh, go to what was then called the Northwest Territory, um, it was such risk involved. The chances of them dying were very good. Well, for one thing, it was youth. And very often, lack of, of family responsibility. They weren't married yet, or they didn't have children yet. Now, they, many of them were married and did have children, and they suffered as a consequence. Ephraim Cutler is one of the main characters of my book. Went out with his wife and four children. Two of his children died en route from disease on, the, on their trip down the Ohio River. In, to a degree, that was part of life. Dying was part of being alive. And dying among children was very common. I'm not sure that I would have gone. <laughs> but I'm very proud of and very impressed by, and I've learned a lot from the people who did go. And that's because they left their records in their private letters, private diaries, unpublished memoirs, so forth. And those have all survived, and they were all in one place. And I had the immense luck of finding them. Well, that's, I think we can never underestimate the importance of luck, not just in life, but in history. And um, it's, it's a factor. You can have very bad luck, but you can also have phenomenally good luck. Reading that book, the, reading The Pioneers, just the letters that you found, that's why I was saying before, it's like you're reporting. It's like, this is, yes. this is what happened because I have proof of it because there's a letter exchange between these well, two people. Well, I also hugely admire those people, not for their courage of going out and doing that, but the purposes they had in mind. They wanted to create an America where all men are created equal in fact, not just words on paper. No slavery. So here they were opening up a territory that was as large as all of the original 13 states in area where there would be no slavery. And that had never been tried before. There were slaves in every one of the original 13 colonies. The other was their total faith in learning, the need for learning. So they were going to create the first public school systems in, ever to be known in America. We had no public schools until then. And the idea that the two primary leaders of creating that first public school system were both men who'd had no real education, and they knew that it was essential to the bigger, better life. And of course, to, to the religion, because you needed to be able to read the Bible. That perception that death was everywhere is, I'm not sure it's a catalyst, but it was like, I could die here or I could die there. It was a motivator to get people to take risks. Risk is part of life. Still is. And I think that what really motivated them was purpose, admirable purpose. And to make life, make society, make the country and its motives higher up in value and importance. My brother had polio. My wife, Rosalie's brother, had polio. It affected their lives in very long-lasting ways. You could die of scarlet fever. Uh, you could die of any number of other medical problems today that nobody cares, nobody worries much about. So is life more valuable now or less valuable now? Oh, it's, it's equally valuable. Yeah. Just as valuable. It's valuable longer if you know how to approach every day and 
beyond the time when you re- retire, supposedly. Well, if you if you the think great of thing it, about my line of work is I don't have to retire <laughs> unless I want to. Have you ever been in a situation in your life where you thought about? And I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about maybe 20 years ago, where you thought about, gee, this is statistically about how much time I have left. This is what I want to do with that time. Did oh, you, sure. Really? Oh, Tell sure. Tell about that. I, know, I knew I didn't want to stop. Yeah. I love my work. I love to do what I do at work far better than anything else in the way of, I don't want to play golf or go fishing or t- play tennis or... But is there anything else besides writing? Yes, painting. Painting, okay. And walking and talking with friends. Oh, and keeping, maintaining contact with old friends. As you age, you, your, your appreciation for certain elements that you took for granted are no, are no longer taken for granted, like your health, your family, friends, and making yourself useful. Well, the, at the bucket we have what's called a bucket age, where people come to the site and you calculate your bucket age, which is basically, statistically, how long you're expected to live, uh, subtract your current age, and that's your bucket age. So I'm about 85, I'm 61, so my bucket age is 24. So I have, statistically, 24 years left to live. And we think that by calculating your bucket age, you will say, this is how many years I have left to live. Mm-hmm. And uh, we think that it might uh, be a catalyst to help people make choices about doing something they've always wanted to do or uh, just... Uh, well, they should. Yeah. They should. Absolutely should. But some things that you used to want to do when you reach the age, say, that I am, I'm 86, I don't much want to do anymore. I don't want to go to Europe. I've been to Europe many times. I don't, I've never been to Asia, but I don't want to, I don't want to leave home. I like it right here. I don't aspire to being a Broadway star anymore. Did you once? Oh, sure. Sure. When I went to college, graduated from college, I had three things or five things I wanted to be. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be an architect. And for a little bit, I thought maybe I'd like to go into medicine, but I couldn't make up my mind. And it suddenly dawned on me, I know what I'll do. I'll go down to New York and something will happen. (laughs) And that's exactly what happened. And it it just appears to me that the happiest people of my generation, let's see, are still the busiest people. Stay busy. And stay, I um, want to get up in the morning. I love the morning. I love getting up and realizing there's a new day ahead of me. I just love it. And I'm married to the most wonderful human being I've ever known. And uh, there's nothing like the, the joy of, of a long-lasting love affair. We've been married 65 years. And wow. I'm as crazy about her today as I was when we first met. So I'm going to ask you a tough question. Let, let's say something happened and uh, hypothetically you were on your deathbed. Would you have any regrets? Is there something? No. no regrets. I'd be as happy as can be that I've had the life I've lived and had the chance to be with the people that I've lived with both in, within my family and within the realm of my work. What would you say to somebody, uh, you know, more like... My, I would feel, my, my real strongest feeling was really gratitude. There's two qualities that history teaches us in a way nothing else does. And it, most people who try to understand why they want to major in history or take history or read it, I don't think they see this in the way that they should. And that is gratitude and empathy. To put yourself in the place of other people. And in order to understand history, you have to be able to put yourself in the place of those people who fought in the revolution or who decided they were gonna 
build the Brooklyn Bridge, and gratitude for what they did for us. And to walk around, oh yeah, this is the way it's always been. No, it hasn't always been. Those people who went before you, in many cases, worked their whole lives or sacrificed their lives so that you could have what you have and you can't take it for granted. Yeah, I, right. I, I, if I have one aspect of my own time in life on the earth that I would change is that I never expressed sufficient gratitude to my mother and father for all they did for me and my brothers. And to thank them for sending me to college, thank them for helping any time I was in trouble of some sort or other. And we all should do that. But to go to the teachers who changed your life, who awakened you in a way that nothing ever had and say, thank you, sir, thank you, ma'am. Now, we didn't do it then and we didn't do it later and I just wish I could do it. So what would you say to people um who feel they're in a rut, who feel like, uh, I like to live that way um, and be grateful and do something I've always wanted to do, but I can't do it. I can't get out of this rut. I can't afford to or something. Is it, a, is it something money will solve or is it an attitude? Well, of course, it's in part both. But I think attitude can, can be stimulated. It can be fertilized often by encouraging that person to try something new, to try making something out of clay or learning more about birds. Or There's so much we don't know that if you know it, life's right. more interesting. And it's all available to us right out there in this miraculous country we live in. I think, people, I think a lot of people are afraid to fail to try something and to fail. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about as part of this um, idea of mortality was the Wright Brothers. Yes. Who, that was a, a wonderful book, learning about all this, realizing how little I knew about all of it. Me, and, me too. And you know, you talk about them, they faced death every day they went up in that airplane. Yep. And how, so how do you think their perception, what their perception was of mortality, and was it that their goal was more important to them, their legacy? I think the answer to your question is all expressed in the very end of the book, when Orville takes his father, who was in his 80s, up for a ride in the plane, in front of a huge crowd gathered outside of Dayton, on the airfield where they had done, with a really cow pasture where they'd done most of their experimenting. And they got up into the air and all the father kept saying, which Orville could clearly hear, higher Orville, higher. That was the spirit that was pre prevailed in the family. One of the reasons I wanted to write the book is how much further beyond the mechanics of flight or bicycle making that was in the mind of Wilbur Wright. When he goes to France and he finds himself transfixed by the paintings in the Louvre and the architecture of the Gothic cathedrals, so that every chance he has, he's going to look at paintings or to visit the great cathedrals. And I thought, what in the hell are you doing in Paris? You're meant to be out in Ohio making bicycles or whatever. And that's what led me to write the book. So I want to ask you, uh, or have you talk a little bit about what we're doing with the bucket, um, this idea of helping people live more fulfilling lives by acknowledging and embracing their own mortality, thinking about their bucket age and how many years they have left and what am I going to do with those years? I'm all for it. I think it's a terrific idea. I think it's, you've got an audience waiting of an audience of size and influence so that what you're providing for them, can be, they can provide for other people, including their children or grandchildren. It's an attitude to develop, an attitude that each day has promise. Each day has 
something of interest or of importance or of help to those who need help that you don't know about yet or a new friend. We all love our old friends, but I'm still making new friends. And I think that's healthy. It isn't, you're not, you don't just want to rely on what you did yesterday or five years ago or 65 years ago. What you can do today. I see people walking along the streets in New York or Boston and wherever they are. And they're all looking at their little cell phones or whatever. And it's a beautiful day. And the sky is bright and blue. And I think, why don't you shut that thing up and get a life? <laughs> it only comes once, life. And enjoy every morsel of it. Good to the last drop. Thank you for listening. To learn more about how to get the most out of your life by embracing your own mortality, go to thebucket.com. That's the bucket, all one word, dot com. And if you know someone you think should be in a future Bucket podcast, let us know at bucketfeedback at thebucket.com. <laughs>